Our passage this morning, continuing through the Sermon on the Mount, is Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. If you have it in your Bibles, on your iPhones, anywhere, please follow along. It will also be on the screens. Please let us read together. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word. We are so grateful that you make yourself so readily available to your creation. That you promise to meet us here, your bride, as we come before you, eagerly wanting to worship you. Father, please bless my words this morning. Allow Mark Burkholder not to get in the way, but allow your spirit to carry a message far beyond my words could. Allow your spirit to transform lives. Thank you for using me as your vessel. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Dan Marino is my best friend. He is, I don't know why you're laughing. Dan Marino and I are BFFs. We are tight as can be. We go out to dinner. We have a handshake like me and Dan Marino. I'm surprised you guys didn't know this. We're like, we're together. Dan Marino and I, we are united. We are, we are best, best buds. You guys don't look convinced. You don't look convinced for some reason. You don't think that someone like me could be friends with Dan Marino? Well, to, well I guess um, to be fair... When I say get dinner together, um, I mean I saw him in a restaurant once. Um, So I can see how that might be misconstrued. But we do have a handshake. We do have a handshake. When I saw him in that restaurant, we came up with this awesome handshake. Uh, Picked it up really quickly. Um, I stick out my right hand, and he sticks out his, and we grab on, and then it's like an up and down and an up and down thing. He picked it up so quickly. But that is Dan Marino and I's handshake. We are best friends. At least I think so. That was like 10 years ago, but I convinced myself that he still lays in bed at night wondering what Mark Burkholder is doing. I think he stalks me on Facebook. I have a tendency to do this. Do any of you? I have a tendency to to make myself feel important by saying that these wonderful people know me. I do it so much. When I was in Chicago, I would tell everybody that I knew Dwayne Wade. Yeah, I know Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade, that's no big deal. Yeah, I know him. When really, our relationship just consisted of a fist bump and a really awkward elevator ride. That was was the extent of our relationship. But I tell them that I know Dwayne Wade, of course. Arnold Palmer? Arnold Palmer and I party together. It's crazy. Arnold Palmer is awesome. Actually, I saw him at a venue once. He was there. He was like one of the celebrity guests. He was on the other side of the tent. But my dad said, hey, there's Arnold Palmer. And I got really excited because the half tea, half lemonade combination is brilliant. Um, But then I realized it was a golfer. I didn't know that until that point. Um, I got really excited thinking there was a drink over there that I could drink and it was, but it was just a golfer. I'm not a huge golf fan, not a huge golf fan. But Arnold Palmer and I are best friends. We're awesome. The one that I say that is probably most realistic is a guy named Al Mohler. I'm not sure if you guys know who Al Mohler is. Al Mohler is the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's a very uh, big modern-day theologian, loved and brilliant. Um, So Al Mohler, I had lunch with Al Mohler, and I tell people this all the time. I may have told some of you. I had lunch with Al Mohler once. And this is a big deal for for pastors and young theologians like myself. I had lunch with him. What I don't tell people is that I was uh, one of 50 people (laughs) that had lunch with him during a group question and answer time. But to my defense, I asked the majority of questions. So we had eye contact for the majority of the time. Um, So I had lunch with Al Mohler. I have a tendency to do this. I have this need to be known by someone awesome in order to provide myself with some sense of security. To make myself feel better, I say that I'm Arnold Palmer's best friend or that I am Dwayne Wade's best friend. I have this need to do so. And I would argue that I'm not the only one who does this. I would say that some of you in here may have some fishing stories about some people you have met as well. 
some wonderful big names that you have met. In our passage today, this is even happening. You see, in our passage today, the setting is judgment day. The setting is judgment day when we come before Christ on that final day to be judged. And there are people saying, yeah, I know him. Lord, Lord, you and I are tight. You and I are tight. And we're going to see what that looks like in today's passage. As I said, we are going through the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's chapter 5 through chapter 7. This is the longest discourse we have of Jesus in Scripture. And it is jam-packed full. I'm sure you guys have realized this by now. It is jam-packed full of amazing, amazing information. Just these three chapters. What we have to realize, though, is that the Sermon on the Mount, when this sermon was actually preached, it was preached to a mixed audience. We know from the passage that Jesus' disciples were with him. It says that he sat among his disciples, but by the end of the passage, we see that the crowds were in awe. So we know that it wasn't just 12 guys around him, but rather it was disciples and the crowds that have been following him this entire time. Now, the crowds that had been following this entire time, they weren't as devoted to him as his 12 disciples were. These were men and women who were awed by the miracles that Jesus had done, had come for the spectacle, for the show, had seen a random crowd of people and said, hey, I want to be a part of that. It was these kind of people and even some religious leaders who came to try to test and to confront Jesus. You see, the Sermon on the Mount has a mixed audience. It needs to be interpreted as if it has a mixed audience then as well. We know that Jesus wasn't just preaching to believers, and he wasn't just preaching to unbelievers, but rather he was preaching to the crowd that consisted of both. Therefore, I would say that the passage we're studying today and many passages within the Sermon on the Mount can be interpreted for both believers and unbelievers. In today's sermon, we're going to be focusing on how it applies to the unbeliever. We're going to be talking some about the application for the believer, which is huge. And we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be super convicting. And you're probably going to leave crying. Um, But it's going to be fantastic. But today, the brunt of what we're going to be talking about is the sermon applied to the unbeliever. First, let's speak of how it applies to the human condition, the condition of the unbeliever. It first speaks to the human condition. By human condition, I mean this is our natural human condition, the nature in which we are born. We are born not as disciples of Christ. We are born not as followers of Jesus, but rather we're born as sinful men and women. I don't know about you, but I was a pretty raunchy two-year-old. When I was two, I knew how to sin. I knew how to mess up. We are born with this natural inclination of sin. We are born with a sinful nature. That means we are born unrighteous, and we're born unable to be righteous. We are born into sin. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 speaks of this. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man... And death through sin, so death spread to all men, because all have sinned. You see, because of Adam's sin in the garden, now we, when we are born, we are all inclined to sin. When we come out of the womb, our natural inclination is to do wrong. We don't come out wanting to serve and love everyone around us. Rather, babies come out very, very selfish. I'm about to find this out, and I am So looking forward to it. So looking forward to those sleeps, those nights where I get two hours of sleep. But we're born with this natural inclination to sin. This is the human condition. We see in today's passage that we have a tendency to deceive ourselves, though. We have this tendency to say, yes, I may be a sinner. I may have messed up. But with our words and everything else, we proclaim that we are righteous, With our words, we say that we are wonderful, wonderful people. That's what's happening first in our passage today. We see that man's words are empty. In the human condition, man's words are empty. In the passage, it begins by saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
will enter the kingdom of heaven. This idea of having the Lord next to each other, it provides a sense of intimacy. It's like calling someone by a beloved nickname. Like, hey, buddy. It's this idea of creating intimacy, and it's these believers who, although are not saved, who the passage says will, won't make it to the kingdom of heaven, but they come before the judgment seat of God saying, Lord, Lord, come on, it's me. You know me. Come on, Lord. They try, to sen- they try to sell this sense of intimacy with the Lord when their heart isn't in it. They have no sincere faith, but rather it is simply words. This is the same thing today. Apart from Christ, any righteous talk, any good words that come out of our mouth are simply that. They are just words. They are empty words. Lord, Lord, come on, Lord. They are simply words, and we deceive ourselves that through words, through just professing these things, that we are saved. But we see in the passage that man's words are empty. We also see that not only his words are empty, but man's hearts are empty too. This is the next group of people that Christ talks about in this passage. It says, on that day, verse 22, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? It's these people who have done these wonderful acts, these seemingly righteous acts, but their acts may be fruitful and full, but what is empty? Their heart is empty. Again, this happens today. We've talked in in the past several weeks about false teachers about teachers who mutilate scripture. They may have these churches of hundreds and hundreds of people, but what is empty is the heart. See, these people that are coming before the judgment seat of the Lord, they may think that they are righteous due to their actions, but again, that's all it is. It is just actions. Their heart is empty. They have no faith in a savior. They are simply providing a resume of works. And we can understand that in this passage, he is directly talking and calling out the religious leaders. Many times throughout Christ's teaching, he goes directly at the religious leaders. These are the ones that combat him, and many times in his teaching, he focuses on them. And everybody knows what he's doing. Everybody here knows what he's doing. The religious leaders understand that he is talking about them, but these religious leaders so often would focus on their elaborate prayers outside, as we've seen in the passage. They made themselves look pale so that everyone could tell they were fasting as we've seen in the Sermon on the Mount. They did these wonderful, elaborate things, but still the Lord says that he doesn't know them. You see, their actions may be magnificent and from our standpoint might look fruitful, but in reality, their hearts are empty. In humanity's condition, we see that man's words are empty. We see that man's hearts are empty are also empty. And when those two things are true, man's future is empty. You see, as I said, this passage takes place. It's calling ahead to the time of judgment day when we'll stand before the Lord, the ultimate judge, and proclaim why we deserve to be into heaven. And these people are are professing solely on words, saying, Lord, Lord, you know me. Or professing on their resume of actions that they've had. And because of their empty words and because of their empty hearts, they have an empty future. We see the response that Jesus gives these people in verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. See, despite their elaborate actions, despite their wonderful words, the fact is that they will still be condemned. Not only condemned, but the law that they claim to obey, the law that they claim to cling to. Christ says that they are being lawless, that they are contradicting that very law in which they take pride. You see, our words cannot save us. Our words accomplish nothing. Our words are solely exterior. When we profess we are righteous, when we profess the wonderful things we do, the many people that we've helped, that's all wonderful, but that is not what saves saves 
is Jesus Christ. We see not only in the passage the human condition, but we see God's requirement. There was a, there was a friend I had growing up. There was a, a friend I had growing up. His name was Mark Leach. We were best friends. We were alike in so many ways. Um, everybody loved him. He was super nice, super funny, super attractive. We were obviously very much alike, as you can tell. Um, but he was, he was this awesome, awesome friend. And we were so tight. We did everything together. Like everybody just knew Mark and Mark were always together. Me and Mark Leach were always together. And then we moved away and I lost contact with him. And a few years ago, I was wondering, I wonder what Mark Leach is up to. I should, I should try to find him on Facebook. So, so I tried to find Mark Leach, and I found Mark Leach. Get this, this is crazy. So at this point, I was a barista at Starbucks living with my parents. Um, he was a successful country artist. That's, that's the one thing that will question your life's choice, right? He was a successful country artist, Mark Leach. And I was amazed by this. I was like, man, this is so cool. He likes music. I like music. Man, we're practically at the same stage in life, Right? So I sent him a message. I was like, Mark Leach, look who it is. It's me. It's Mark. You remember me? I didn't get a message back. What the heck? I was like, all right, maybe not. So I sent him another message. Probably he just didn't see it, obviously. So I sent him another message. I was like, hey, Mark, it's me. Remember me from, from Canton? We used to do, have all this fun times together and everything like that. And I recorded a few memories and still didn't hear back from him. Crazy. And then I thought, there's, there's this one thing that is going to remind him who I am. It's a little strange, but in between these fingers, I have a freckle. You can't see it. If you want to see it afterwards, I will gladly show you my freckle. All right? I have a freckle here. Mark Leach had the same freckle. Crazy. Mark Leach had the same freckle in between these two fingers. So obviously, I knew there can't be another person in this world that has this freckle. So not weird at all. I sent him a picture of my freckle. So I took... <laughs> I took a picture of my freckle and sent it to him on Facebook thinking, this is it. He's going to know it's me. We have matching freckles. We were meant to be friends. Still no response. What is up with this? He didn't even respond to my freckle. I couldn't believe it. A few weeks ago, one of my friends from Canton told me that it's a different Mark Leach. <laughs> Not the same guy at all. Entirely different guy. The Mark Leach I know is married with a kid and he's doing really well too, but this country artist is not my Mark Leach. <laughs> now, as silly as that illustration is, it mimics so much what is happening in this passage. I go up to, to this country artist Mark Leach and I'm like, hey man, it's me, you remember me? In reality, he has no idea who I am. No, Mark, you remember me. Remember, we had all of these memories together. We did these great things. It was awesome. No idea who I was. Sent him a picture of my freckle. Didn't know who I was. And this is what happens. This is what goes through the mind of someone who doesn't have Christ. They call out to Jesus, no, come on, I know you. It's us. Remember, we did all of these things together. But rather, the Jesus that they thought they were worshiping wasn't the Jesus Christ, Son of God, at all. It was a fictional divine creature that they have made up to appease themselves, to make them feel more secure. But we call out to him as unbelievers saying, come on, you know me. See, the human condition is one that is separate from Christ. As I said, we see God's requirement in the passage. God is a holy, righteous God. His kingdom is a place of holiness and righteousness. Whoever is allowed in the kingdom is someone who is holy and righteous. This is God's requirement. He is a holy God. Therefore, the Father requires perfection. The Father requires perfection. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this, You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You see, perfection is the requirement. Perfection is the standard. This means complete obedience, complete obedience to the law. 
That is true righteousness. In order to enter the kingdom of heaven, it's not simply words, it's not simply some actions, but rather it is complete, full righteousness, complete, full obedience. The Father requires perfection. We also, in the passage, we see this. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, the Father requires perfection, but he also requires for his will to be accomplished. The Father requires his will to be accomplished. He requires complete obedience, and he requires his will to be done fully. In order for a judge in the local courts in Broward County to be seen as just, he must require complete obedience to the law. That is what makes a just judge. And then a just judge also requires that when a sentence is spoken, that sentence is carried out to completion as he has professed it, right? A judge requires obedience to the law, and a judge requires the will to be done. This is a just judge. It is not an angry judge or an unfair judge, but rather a just judge. Our God is the same. He is just. He is the just judge. Judge, therefore, he requires complete obedience to his law and he requires his will to be done. Have you met God's requirement? Have you lived that fully righteous life, that life that is so dedicated to the law that nothing went past you? That you have accomplished the law to perfection, that you have had complete obedience, that in every area of life you have accomplished his will. I don't think it's a bold prediction to say that there is no one in here who has. I know I haven't. I know you haven't. Scripture tells us that none of, none of us have. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. See, despite our words, despite our lofty language, despite our actions apart from Christ, we are not righteous. Apart from Christ, there is no way that we could enter the righteous kingdom of God. God requires perfection. And no man has fulfilled God's requirement. But Christ came to earth in order to fulfill this requirement. The beauty of the gospel is that this is a requirement that has been fulfilled. We see Christ's fulfillment. Christ tells us earlier in the Sermon on the Mount... In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Rather, I have come to abolish, I have come, not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Let me read that again. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You see, Christ came to fulfill the law. The Son fulfills the law. The law. The standard that God set of perfection is the law. It is the law of the Old Testament. That is the standard that the Jewish people needed to live by in order to live a perfect life. The law does not save in any way. The law does not save in any way. Righteous works do not save in any way. The law condemns, but Christ saves. We see in Scripture that the law points out our sin, but Christ fulfills the law. See, Christ fulfilled the standard of perfection. He lived a perfect righteous, he lived in perfect righteousness and perfect obedience. He fulfilled the law and accomplishes the will of the Father as well. We see that the Son accomplishes the will of the Father. Of the Father. The Greek word in this passage is boyeo. Right there it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, I will will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does. Boyeo is a a Greek verb meaning to do. And here it's used as a substance in participle, which means it's used as a noun. And very interestingly enough, it's used as a singular 
Now, it's not saying that whoever does the will of the Father, because as we already discussed, we cannot do the will of the Father. But it says, the one who does the will of the Father. Who is the one who does the will of the Father? Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Christ submits to the will of the Father. Matthew 26, verse 39 says, And going a little farther, is in the garden of Gethsemane just before the crucifixion. He fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see over and over again that Christ surrendered to the will of the Father. That he lived a life of perfection, that he fulfilled the law, but also that he accomplished the Father's will. This is the beauty of the gospel. Because since Christ has met the requirement of the law, it has been fulfilled. We no longer need to try to um, attain these law standards in order for salvation. Rather, Christ has fulfilled the law. He has provided the righteousness for salvation. So now we simply need to place our faith in Christ to obtain his righteousness. Again, a little recap. We started talking about the human condition. The human condition is a fact that, that our words are empty, just simple language does not save, that our actions apart from Christ do not save, that those, those things in and of themselves are not good enough. Because we saw that God's requirement is a requirement of perfection. And anything short of perfection we see in the passage is complete condemnation, an eternity apart from God, an eternity apart from anything good. It is complete condemnation, an eternity in hell if we do not meet the standard of perfection. But then Christ comes on the scene as the beautiful Savior who fulfills the law. And if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we can obtain his righteousness and we can fulfill God's requirements. As I said, April and I got married this past October. A few months ago, we got married, um, and it was beautiful because she's beautiful. I was just there weeping and weeping and weeping, and she was just there beautiful as ever, like it was no big deal, and whatever. I guess she thought, I can do better. Um, uh, no, but, but it was this beautiful, beautiful event. Now, weddings and marriages and unions are so awesome because it is truly a union of two people. It is a union of one person being united with another person. So when we got married, April had a little bit of debt from, from medical expenses and things like that. But fortunately for me, I've been blessed with, with a, a savings account and I had some savings built up. So that when we got married, when we were united, her debt then became my debt, but my savings and my financial security became her savings and financial security. You see, her debt that she had, she could not pay off. The debt that she had, she could not get rid of. She wasn't at a place in her life where she could get rid of it, but in being married to me, I had the finances in order to clear the debt. This isn't just a beautiful story of April and I's marriage. This applies so much to your relationship with Christ. You see, you have a huge sin debt. You have a huge debt. There is no way that you could ever come close to meeting the requirement of God of perfection. Not a chance you could ever pay off that debt. But when we are united with Christ, when we place our faith in Christ, when we are joined with him, his righteousness and fulfilling the law becomes our righteousness and we fulfill the law. See, salvation doesn't come through words. Salvation doesn't come through actions, but rather salvation only comes through the person of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, 
And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ this morning? Do you realize the magnitude of that decision? That apart from Christ, you are simply drowning in your sin debt, headed straight for condemnation, heading straight for pain. But Jesus is here saying, I love you. I have an answer. I have solution. Please be united with me. Please place your faith in me. Please be joined with me and have my righteousness. This is the gospel message. This is what the church is based on. This is beauty. We mentioned at the beginning that the Sermon on the Mount was meant for two audiences. It was meant for the unbeliever, but it was also meant for the believer. The passage tells us that he sat there and that the disciples sat around him, so we know that this passage also can be applied to the life of a believer. Now, the life of believers is different from human's condition because our sin nature, our human condition has been wiped clean by placing our faith in Christ. But yet we have another condition. I've called it the church's condition. The church's condition. Now, by the church, I mean the true church, the body of believers, the group of people who have truly placed their faith in Jesus Christ that are completely saved, that are his children, that make up the bride of Christ. And the church's condition is one of salvation. But this does not in any way just mean a one-time salvation. Scripture is very, very clear. Scripture is very clear that salvation is not simply a one-time action. Salvation isn't just a past occurrence, but rather we were saved... We are being saved, and one day we will be saved. All three of these are taught in Scripture. Earlier we talked about how man's words, how our words apart from Jesus are empty. But now we see that countered with Jesus Christ. Because we see that his words, Christ's words, save us. This is the first aspect of the church's condition. His words save us. This is the theological term justification. We see that we are justified all throughout Scripture. Justification is the legal act where God declares the sinner to be innocent from his or her sins. It is not that the sinner is now sinless, but that he is declared sinless. You see, at that point in our life where we surrender to the will of the Father, where we realize that everything apart from Christ is futile and we are in desperate need of him, at that point when we realize that and we surrender to the will of the Father, we are justified. We are declared righteous. It doesn't mean that your every action will be righteous, but it says that at that moment, you are saved, you are declared righteous, you are justified. And we oftentimes stop there. We oftentimes stop with the one time when we were saved. We stop at that one prayer we prayed, that one moment that we remember in our past. Salvation stops here, but salvation that stops there is not true salvation. Because the salvation that is not in the progress of saving us and that will save us cannot be separated from a salvation that was. You see, a salvation that was will continue to save us and will save us. We have to realize that not only did his word save us that we were justified, but we have to realize that our hearts are in the process of being saved. That our hearts are being saved. This is called sanctification. This is called sanctification. This is the part of salvation where we grow in our salvation, where we grow in our righteousness. This is taught all throughout Scripture. A few passages for you. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if we simply say that we are Christ's disciples and are not actively living out our salvation, you are entirely missing the definition of salvation. You are entirely missing out on what salvation is. Salvation absolutely not is absolutely not a get-out-of-hell-free card. It is not just simply this one time that we profess, all right, I got it, now I can go live my own way. That is not salvation in the least, but salvation is a transformation. A transformation that, yes, has a starting point, a transformation that continues. We were justified, but you were also being sanctified. My daughter is coming in a few weeks. I'm so excited for her to get here. And I'm so excited for her to make a decision. When she's old enough to make words, she's old enough to say, I am an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. <laughs> I am so excited for her to make that decision that she is an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. And she will, don't get me wrong, she will. <laughs> she will make that statement, but a true Ohio State Buckeyes fan doesn't simply just say they're a Buckeyes fan. A fan that just says, oh, I'm a Ohio State Buckeyes fan, doesn't watch the game, doesn't have any gear, doesn't know any of the players, that's not a Buckeyes fan. But rather, she will say, I am an Ohio State Buckeyes fan, and she will grow up on Saturday mornings watching Ohio State football with me, growing in what it means to be an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. In the same way as our salvation. Yes, we are justified. There is a point when we are declared righteous, when we surrender to God, but we continually are being transformed. We are continually being turned more into the image of God. We are being sanctified. Let me clarify something. I do not mean in any way that if you are struggling with sin, you are not a Christian. Nor am I saying that if this year has, been, has produced less fruit than last year, that you should question your salvation. That is not what is being said here at all. We ought to be confident in our salvation, confident in the power of the Holy Spirit to save us and to continue to save us. But what I'm saying is that we ought to continually submit to God's will in order for him to transform us. We ought to continually remind ourselves that salvation was not a one-time occurrence, but it is a continual occurrence of submitting to the will of the Father. You see, we were saved but now we are being saved. If you are with me in that boat of being saved, you know that sin is a struggle. You know that you wake up on days realizing that life is incredibly difficult. If you're feeling those feelings, that does not mean you are not a child of God. What that means is that you still have remnants of the human condition. But rather, we are children of God who he loves and will transform and will sanctify. And it's hard work. It is tough. It is strenuous to be chiseled away of all the negativities and be built up by Christ. It is difficult and relationships may be broken and hardships will come. But that is the fruit of Jesus transforming your life. But just as this passage is applicable for the unbeliever, let me ask you, although you are saved and have submitted to the will of God, are your words empty? Are your words sometimes futile where you know all of the Christian lingo, you know all of the Bible verses, where they roll off your tongue with ease, but in reality there is no relationship with Christ. Your relationship is struggling, although on the outside you may appear to have it all together, but inside you are hurting. Is your heart hurting? Are you still on the outside doing all of these things that I know I ought to be doing and I know I ought to love doing, but I just don't feel it? I'm hurting. This is the remnants of the human condition. 
These are the times when we most certainly have to submit to the will of God through prayer. That in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our struggle, we have to submit to God. This doesn't mean that you're not saved. But it does mean that God is calling you to himself more and more every day as he is with all of us. You see, we were saved. We know that we are in the process of being saved. We are being sanctified. But we will also one day be saved. We were declared righteous. Now we are being made righteous. And one day we will be glorified with Christ and righteousness. In contrast to what the passage says, our future is not empty. But rather, our future will be saved. If we have placed our faith in Christ and are being transformed, we can be confident in our future salvation. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14 says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. When we read passages like this and question our salvation, you're not only questioning your salvation, you're questioning the strength of the Holy Spirit. Because if you have surrendered your life to Christ, if there was a moment when you were saved, when you are continually submitting to the life of Christ, even if this year has been so much more of a struggle than last year, when you are submitting to his will, the Holy Spirit has sealed you and will protect you and carry you to completion so that one day we will be glorified with him in heaven.